India a special partner for two reasons. One is values, the other is strategic interests. And hence, India for him was so, so special. When uh, Prime Minister Modi visited Japan in 2018, Prime Minister Abe invited Prime Minister Modi to his uh, personal cottage uh, at the Mount of Fuji uh, near Lake Kawaguchi. And they had a uh, one-on-one -on -one dinner. So soon afterwards, a number of uh, embassies quietly approached to me saying, can my president, can my prime minister also get invited to Abe-san's cottage? <laughs> prime Minister Abe's answer was always immediate and clear. No, because that place is specifically reserved to Prime Minister Modi. We're gathered here at the Sridhar Sriram Auditorium to celebrate the legacy of a visionary leader, Mr. Shinzo Abe, through the work of Mr. Sanjay Abaru in his book, The Importance of Shinzo Abe, and his contributions, of course, in strengthening the relationship between India and Japan and building the Indo-Pacific relations. So today, we are extremely honored to have His Excel Excellency Hiroshi, um, Ambassador Hiroshi Suzuki uh, who serves as the, as the ambassador of Japan to India and Bhutan. He's had uh, several prominent diplomatic roles worldwide um, and uh, uh, many significant positions within the Japanese government, of course, uh, and uh, especially in his capacity of uh, international spec uh, press po uh, spokesperson and private secretary under the Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe at the PM House. He was also appointed as an advisor to the special secretary for the state funeral for uh, PM Abe in uh, July 20, uh, 2022. His Excellency has also served as the senior deputy minister for foreign affairs and a minister at the Japanese embassies in London and Seoul. Joining him today are, uh, first of all, Ambassador uh, Lakshmi Murdeshwar Puri. Um, you know, because of whose support we are here today and we have all these dignitaries. So I think a huge thanks to you, ma'am. Um, a former as Assistant uh, Secretary General at the United Nations and the former Deputy Executive Director of UN Women. And uh, before her 15-year stint at the UN, uh, she served as an uh, Indian diplomat for 28 long years. And um, obviously with one of her first postings, her language posting in fact, being to Japan at the Japanese, uh, the Indian Embassy um, in Tokyo. And uh, the, our second speaker, of course, is uh, Mrs. Suhashni Haider. I'm sure a lot of you here are familiar with her, an Indian journalist and the diplomatic editor of The Hindu. Uh, she has been actively involved in covering international affairs, diplomatic issues, foreign policy, and she's known for her insightful analysis and reporting on various ge geopolitical events. And uh, obviously, she is uh, one of uh, our only panelists today who has uh, contributed a chapter to this particular book that we're discussing today. <laughs> And uh, yes, and to moderate the session, we have my professor, Professor Ranjana Mukhopadhyay. She's a professor of Japanese studies in the Department of East Asian Studies, University of Delhi. She has authored the book, 70 Years of India-Japan Diplomatic Relations, Reflections and Way Forward. This book is an outcome of a conference organized in 2022 by the Indian Council of World Affairs, the ICWA, to commemorate the 70 years of uh, diplomatic relations between India and Japan. Thank you, Pranita. Uh, good morning um, and a very warm welcome to all our audience who have joined us today on a very cold morning of the weekend. And uh, again, once again, I would like to welcome our esteemed uh, speakers on the dais, Ambassador Suzuki, Ambassador Lakshmi Puriji, and uh, Mrs. Suhasini Haiderji. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Sapan Das Gupta ji and the organizers of, of Delhi University Literature Festival for putting together a session on Japan to discuss a very important and recent, very interesting book on by Sir Sanjay Baru's, which is titled, which is on late uh, Shinzo Abe. I titled the importance of uh, Shinzo Abe, India, Japan, and the Indo-Pacific. Most of you are have heard 
version zuabi and many of my, i can see many of my students here and uh, you would all know that he was the longest serving uh, prime minister of japan and he served two tenures one first one was from 2006 to 2007 and then the second was from 2012 to 2000 20 and and, and uh, very unfortunately he was assassinated in july uh, um, 2022 So uh, in this uh, uh, book, uh, if we uh, uh, by uh, think this uh, forward is written by uh, our uh, external affairs minister, uh, Dr. S. Jay Shankar, and in the in fact he has uh, titled the forward as a personal tribute. And if I may quote from there, I quote: It is not often in contemporary times that a Japanese leaders are credited with fresh thinking in international relations. Shinzo Abe was an exception because of his political boldness, his perspective grasp of uh, global changes, and not the least, the uh, political longevity to translate ideas into reality. Unquote. So undoubtedly, it was the geopolitical vision of uh, Shinzo Abe that made Indo-Pacific a strategic reality, and also he was the the quad, that is the, um, the quadrilateral security dialogue that brought. four major democracies of the world that is united states japan australia and india into one uh, platform that was also his uh, brain child so these two major geopolitical ideas of shinzo abe are now actually the cornerstone of of the very vibrant uh, strategic partnership that we see between india and japan and uh, so that is uh, a lot of there's discussion about that in this book So, for uh, I'm presume most of you have read the book, but for some reason you have didn't have the opportunity to go through the book. This book has three uh, major sections. The first is about Abe's uh, legacy for Japan, which examines Abe's uh, domestic politics and his initiative for economic revival, which is often called as Abe Nomics. And uh, there are actually three writers in this book who are also close aide uh, of uh, Shinzo Abe. and it is very interesting that uh, most of these people are actually saying that shinzo abe should be credited for getting economic revival linking economic revival with foreign security issues or getting uh, for or on the other hand also getting foreign security issues into domestic political debates the second section is about uh, abe and india japan japan india relations which discusses of course abe's contribution to india japan relations and how he sort of reframed the relations between these two countries uh, which has become a very vital partnership in asia now and the third uh, section is uh, about abe and indo pas uh, and the indo pacific which examines of course the strategic world view uh, that was behind conceptualization of indo pacific and the quad so if you go through all this uh, uh, all the chapters in the book it it is very obvious people are actually crediting abe for shinzo abe for the uh, for the greater heights that he took india japan relations but they are also asking a very pertinent question is why india why india was so important in the geo uh, political thinking uh, uh, thinking of uh, shinzo abe so i think uh, that is uh, one of the questions like uh, i would actually like to start with our uh, ambassador suzuki like uh, since i uh, as uh, was uh, said in his introduction he had a very long stint with uh, with mr late mr shinzo abe i think right when the time from a 2005 when he was the cabinet chief cabinet secretary you were his secretary and then um, i i think what we read in your profile was that uh, even in, during both the tenures of abe you were in, uh, in the uh, abe's uh, prime minister's office as a spokesperson to foreign international media and also as his private secretary so i think we will be deeply uh, benefited from your ringside view and the whole thing is that why uh, i mean the people who like uh, suhasini just talked about kishi is uh, his because of his grandfather but i think there's more to that just uh, the the bloodline there should be something more to why it's become so important why india has become so important became so important in the strategic world view of uh, shinzo abe thank you oh well, first of all thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this delhi university literature festival and i'd like to thank festival director dr swapan gasgupta and everybody who is in, who are involved in organizing this uh, great event and uh, my huge thank you to ambassador lakshmi puri you really honor us with your presence 
this morning. And thank you also for Mr. Suhashi Nihaida to join me on the panel. And of course, Professor Ranjana Mukubayatiya. Yes, <laughs> for also uh, having me on the panel. So uh, you asked me, why is India so important? Before I go into that, please read this book. This is an amazing book. It has everything you need to know about this special partnership between India and Japan and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's vision of free and in, a free and open Indo-Pacific and how the Quad has become to be established and the importance of Quad. So, uh, and this book is an easy read. It has 16 chapters, is uh, 10 to 20 pages. So if you read one chapter a night, you can finish this book in a little over two weeks and you can become a scholar on free and Indo-Pacific and the Quad, uh, let alone a specialist on this uh, special partnership between India and Japan, uh, which is both uh, global and strategic. So do read this book, please. You, you asked me, why India? Uh, as uh, someone who served him uh, up close, the first thing that comes to my mind is that Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was a leader who attached utmost priority on fundamental values, values such as freedom, democracy, human rights, and rule of law. And for Prime Minister Abe, India shares all these fundamental values. So for him, India was and is a natural partner. So as early as 20 years back, when he wrote a book entitled Towards a Beautiful Nation, there is a chapter on Asia, and he specifically refers to India as sharing those fundamental values. So he says, we should create this special partnership with India, and on that basis, we can add the United States, because the United States is Japan's only ally, and then Australia too, because Australia also shares these fundamental values. So, so th this is uh, my take on uh, 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 why India. Because uh, Prime Minister Abe had the conviction that two greatest democracies in Asia, India and Japan, must take the leading role in preserving peace, and prosperity of the region and of the world. So for him, India was the natural partner, special partner. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. Actually, if you go through the book, I'll just uh, come in. The, 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 uh, three of them, the writers are like um, Take Nakahezu and Taniguchi Tomohiku and Kanehara uh, Nomukatsu. Probably they were your colleagues when, because they were all were, also had served in the uh, almost the same time when you were there. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I know them uh, very well. Yes. Yeah. So my my, my old, all yeah. are my good friends. Yes. So it's very interesting. They all have said like he was a man of the hour, and he uh, stood up at the time when uh, and took up very. Un, uh, he actually challenged the orthodoxy that was there in the in, uh, international relations, uh, which uh, I mean, which was actually engraved in the in the um, Yoshida doctrine. And he sort of, uh, while giving due importance to US, he wanted to expand it beyond uh, that uh, realm. But there's another author, his name is Takemori Hir um, Horimoto, and he sort of worries at the end, he puts a statement, he says, Japan and India are heading into uncharted waters with no nautical chart. And his, his concern is, uh, is actually that since Abe is no more, and uh, whether what, uh, what would be the future of this Indo-Pacific, so how do you see it? Like, 
Well, uh, Prime Minister Abe was, of course, a man of great visions. And uh, he wanted to bring about fundamental reforms so that Japan can take on major challenges of the day. So one of his uh, major vision in terms of economics was Abenomics. Actually, this was his uh, campaign platform when he came back to power again back in 2012. And uh, he said, uh, we need three arrows. The first arrow of proactive fiscal spending, the second arrow of bold monetary policy, and the third arrow of growth strategy, which cut through the vested interests. So as you can see, he was fighting the vested interest to bring about drastic deregulation to really uh, energize the Japanese economy. Uh, another vision of his was uh, uh, to create a society where women shine. And Ambassador Lakshmi, Lakshmi Puri, uh, you know this very well because at that time you were heading the UN woman. But uh, Prime Minister Abe said, uh, Abenomics is womenomics. And Lehman Brothers would not have gone bankrupt if it were Lehman Brothers and sisters. <laughs> so, so, so he... He initiated a major international conference called uh, on women empowerment called uh, World Assembly for Women. And uh, as a result, at the end of his tenure, the uh, uh, woman participation ratio uh, in Japan uh, has uh, surpassed uh, that of the U.S. in every age bracket. So, so as you can see, these are major reforms uh, on economy and on society. And of course, uh, on defense and foreign policy, he challenged the taboos uh, by reinterpreting the Japanese constitution. Japanese constitution was traditionally interpreted as allowing the Japanese government to only exercise the uh, self-defense, but not the collective self-defense. So, you know, U.S. forces are deployed to defend Japan. So I will give you a hypothetical example, which could be very real. Now, when North Korea fires ballistic missiles, and North Korea is firing lots of, uh, test firing lots of ballistic missiles, now we have missile alerts. And when they fire ballistic missiles, of course, Japanese self-defense forces come on alert, but the U.S. forces also come on alert. So U.S. Aegis ships are deployed in the Sea of Japan together with Japanese naval self-defense forces. Now, until Prime Minister Abe reinterpreted the Japanese constitution, the Japanese self-defense forces could not defend U.S. Aegis ships if they were attacked by North Korea. But thanks to Prime Minister Abe, we now have a set of laws called peace and security legislation, which enables Japanese self-defense forces to protect US Egypt ships and other US forces, which are deployed to defend Japan. You, you, you think it's only natural, but uh, such was the state of Japanese constitution's interpretation, which was outdated. So, so he made a major effort to update the legal interpretation so that Japan can face, take on the challenges, major challenges that we face today. And uh, uh, coupled with this, he, he engaged in proactive diplomacy not just uh, within the purview of Indo-Pacific, but going well beyond to reaching out to Middle East, to Africa, you know, you know, TICAT, and then to Latin America. So, so this was Prime Minister Abe's uh, proactive diplomacy, which is, uh, you know, if you will, as if to 
look at the globe and see how the world is changing and what kind of proactive diplomacy Japan should do. That was uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, uh, outlook. So, so he was really a man of great visions. Yeah, and I think he was also very pragmatic, <laughs> which all politicians should be. Okay, now um, uh, with the permission, I'd like to move on to our next uh, uh, speaker, uh, Mrs. Suhasini Haider, who is actually also a contributor to this book. And uh, it's very interesting, Suhasini, you, you uh, start your uh, chapter with a very interesting uh, one-liner. It says, Shinzo Abe's interest in politics was like his interest in India. It was bred in the bone. So, uh, yeah, so um, basically because, of course, uh, his grandfather, Prime Minister Kishi, was the first who, uh, Japanese Prime Minister to, to have an outreach to India. And he visited uh, India, I think even Abe accompanied him during that visit in 1957, I think. But, uh, okay, he ha heard a lot about it. So uh, it's very interesting, like when you're saying, if, uh, well, in, even in India, we see political dynasts. And I, I'm sure as a journalist, you have interacted with a lot of them. And uh, most of the uh, people who come from political families, they leverage their family connections for domestic politics, basically, basically vote bank politics. But it is very interesting to see that Abe, he actually, his uh, strategic decisions and also his, uh, his uh, geopolitical worldview was actually influenced by his father, which you mentioned that his uh, three uh, relations with three countries like US, uh, uh, I think then China. Uh, China and India was all how um, Kishi had experienced uh, these countries and what was his experiences with this country. But uh, adding to that, uh, what I, what I felt that uh, both Kishi, uh, Prime Minister Kishi and Prime Minister Abe lived in very different geopolitical situations. I mean, um, because uh, that time, yes, China was an important neighbor, but it was not a, a sort of a threat what uh, Abe saw during his time. And uh, also, India had was important, but it had sort of receded out of uh, uh, Japan's uh, during 80s and 90s from Japan's uh, geopolitical considerations. And uh, so, in many ways, he might be a dynast, but uh, most people like us, when we look at Abe, we see him as more as a path breaker. Like he actually tried to move out of the uh, legacy issues. And one of them, uh, we all know he was very much involved with the North Korean abduction issues, which I, th I don't think any of the authors have actually mentioned in this book, precisely because it had nothing to do with Japan, India probably. So I'd like to know uh, like uh, your views on this, like on the two different geopolitical circumstances in which the father, grandfather and the grandson worked. Thank you. You know, thanks so much and thank you uh, for all of you to come and listen to what many might consider an arcane subject. I hope over time, uh, Japan-India ties are the subject of many more uh, young people taking up these studies. But, uh, you know, I do want to uh, defer with you on two points. One, where you said that this cannot just be about bloodlines. Uh, the other, where you uh, uh, said the geopolitical situation was different because there are similarities. And when I said bread in the bone, it's for a particular reason. I see most of you must be in your teens or your 20s. How many of you have a very uh, uh, important relationship with one of your grandparents and how much do they influence you? Can you just show me with a show of hands? So I see quite a few of you. And now you think in a traditional society as Japan is, Asian societies. Uh, here was Nobusuke Kishi, this power figure in Japan. Uh, three members of the family had been in politics. Uh, Shinzo Abe's grandfather was prime minister. His grandfather's brother was prime minister. In fact, for longer, actually, for about eight years. Uh, his father was the foreign minister. Uh, his grandfather was this power figure. And he grew up hearing from him about his vision of the world. When Nobusuke Kishi passed away, Shinzo Abe was 33 years old. So think about that. Think about the kind of ideas he would have imbibed. So I started with that idea um, and tried to look at what was the kind of uh, possible clues we see in Shinzo Abe's uh, uh, lifetime. 
that connect him to what was happening there. To begin with, in 2018, um, when uh, Shinzo Abe came for one of his most important visits to India, unfortunately also his last visit to India, uh, because he was supposed to come back in 2019, uh, he wasn't able to because of the Citizenship Amendment Act uh, protests in Guwahati, uh, he subsequently, there was COVID and he, then he fell ill. When he came back to politics and he was still, you know, president of the India-Japan Friendship uh, Association over there, um, unfortunately, his life was cut very short. And I think India lost for that. And that is the reason why when he passed away, you saw an outpouring in India that someone who was a friend of India's had died. Um, and I think that was it was very natural. And the book that came out as a result of that was because of the strong feelings so many people had. Um, and the book came out within a year of his passing, which I think is quite creditable in, in today's time. So sitting on his grandfather's knee, he writes himself in 2018 uh, in an article which was published as a kind of advertisement almost in all the papers, where he talks about learning from his grandfather about his grandfather's visit to India. It was one of the first visits that Nobusuke Kishi took. And it was at a controversial time. Nobusuke Kishi was still seen in many parts of the world. Japan was seen as one of the aggressors of the war. Uh, Kishi himself was seen as one of the uh, war criminals. He was in jail for a brief period. Um, he was in, in, in Tojo's cabinet. And there was all of this baggage that he was carrying with him, uh, along with the perils of you know, colonialism, of feeling uh, like second-class citizens in your own country. Um, when he went to Delhi and got this amazing reception, Pandit Nehru went to the airport. Uh, he then proceeded to hold a, a public rally with Nabuske Kishi. Uh, and, and Shinzo Abe writes about this, where he says, the respect my father got. And I, I, I'll just read to you what he, uh, what he actually wrote uh, in that uh, particular, um, hold on one sec, uh, in, in, in that particular um, uh, piece where he says that the respect that my father got, at the time Japan was a poor country, and yet the kind of respect he got, the kind of, um, uh, you know, J uh, Pandit Nehru saying that this is a man that I respect, uh, this is a prime minister who's well-loved in Japan, uh, and open that relationship. So that was the first part. It was about the respect that he received at a, con you know, at a controversial time for himself. He was still, um, uh, you know, developing his own policies. Some of it also, I think, bled into how uh, Shinzo Abe took an interest in two places in India, the Northeast, uh, as well as the Andaman Islands. And that was because of the role of the Indian National Army and Netaji, uh, Subhash Chandra Bose. Uh, at the time. And before he died, uh, he had actually written out his speech. He planned to go to Manipur, where Japanese soldiers had been killed. Now, this is all part of a controversial history for India as well, because, of course, India was on the other side during the war. But I think it is a credit to both Kishi uh, and, and to Shinzo Abe that they have been able to put aside the obvious political differences that Japan and India perhaps should have had and instead made it a personal connection. Uh, finally, I want to talk a little bit about how Nobusuke Kishi's plans, uh, you know, long before Xi Jinping in 2013 or 2014 talked about Asia for Asians. Uh, Nobusuke Kishi spoke about Asian development for Asians. Uh, and Japan, despite at that time being a small economy in the 50s, uh, had started the ODA, Overseas Development Assistance. And no country, because of the political reasons, because of the war, and because, you know, nobody saw Japan as this big power at the time, uh, nobody really wanted to accept uh, financial assistance. And Pandiji decided to accept that financial assistance. Of course, today, you know, somebody referred to, uh, re referred to how Japan is in every part of our lives. All of you take the Delhi Metro, for example, uh, to come here. Uh, but at that time, that little, uh, I think the assistance was some 24 crores for projects. Um, that assistance meant a lot, not just for the person who received it, but for the person who gave it, because it gave an acceptance, it gave a, a respect. Uh, and I think those are some of the, the parts that Abe imbibed from his grandfather. Uh, of course, as you said, ties with the U.S. Abe's grandfather was, was responsible for the security treaty. And in the book that Ambassador Suzuki mentions, uh, Towards a Beautiful Country, Abe writes about an emotional moment for him 
when in school, his teacher actually challenged him and said, we should never have had this security treaty with the United States. Uh, and Abe countered that. It was a driving desire, obviously, for him in his political career to somehow not just exonerate his grandfather, but to give him the rightful place. I'd, I'd, I'd finally like to say in, in a lot of what I read was that Abe's uh, relationship with India was twofold. One part of it was to build the Japan-India relationship, to make it uh, perhaps in one day a household name and towards a beautiful country. He says, if we play our cards right in a decade, so he wrote this in 2007, he said in a decade, the Japan-India relationship could actually be stronger than the Japan-US or Japan-China relationship. Of course, he wrote this in, in 2007. I wouldn't say that that has been achieved. But what I will say is it was clear that he was committed to that. He also was very committed to, he believed in India, not just in the relationship, he believed in India's role on the global stage. And that's why when he introduced his idea of the confluence of the two seas, which brings with it not just the confluence of the Indo-Pacific, but it brings with him with it the ideas of the international rule of law, uh, the confluence of democracies in a sense, the importance of democracy in both countries. He chose to do it in the Indian parliament in 2008. I don't think you can get more symbolism uh, to, to why, when the question you asked was why India, uh, than to what Abe chose to do each time when it was with India, whether it was with Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and then the very close bond he uh, developed with Prime Minister Modi. Uh, and he said, uh, one was my mentor and the other uh, was, was my closest friend, you know? So I, I, I think um, we, do, we, we stand to lose if we forget any part of this legacy because it means something not just to Japan and to India, but to our position in the world. Thanks, uh, Suhasini. I mean, it's wonderful. I mean, <laughs> it's a very nice exposition and, and I think very well you captured his spirit. And uh, So I will come back to you again. So I'd now like to move to uh, Ambassador Lakshmi Puriji. Ma'am, you, uh, you said that you started with Japan and that was you had a language posting there. And uh, then uh, subsequently also from our earlier conversations, you told us that you had a uh, you kept associating with Jap uh, Japan in various capacities. So, uh, but you were at a time, uh, you've seen a time when it was pre-Abe, or let me put it, it uh, the relationship was not so vibrant. And now you are seeing where it is, uh, now, thanks to Abe's geopolitical vision, it is a very vibrant uh, relationship and actually one of the most important strategic partnership in Asia, if not in the world. So how do you see actually this transition? And uh, if I may ask the question which I had asked uh, Ambassador Suzuki, uh, why India is important mm -hmm. for Japan? If I may ask you, why Japan is important for India? <laughs> so if you could just enlighten us. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I share uh, the sentiment of this panel that our young people, and particularly my uh, Delhi University, should be one of the strongest centers of Japanese studies and understanding Japan and linking up with Japan because uh, it is indeed one of the strongest, most consequential and important partnerships for India. Uh, and as was mentioned that it is, uh, by, by Suhasini, that it is also both for Japan and for India, it is uh, a vital partnership. I'm here really to pay tribute uh, to this great man who brought about a quantum jump in uh, Indo-Japanese relations, a kind of transformation I couldn't have dreamt of when I was in Japan in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, and even uh, before 2007, for that matter. So I, I just want to first of all say that the exceptionalism of uh, Abhisama, if I may call him that, he was, um, I think one of the key aspects that has been brought out here is that he had this unique ability to transcend the 
stubborn orthodoxies of the previous era and the previous epoch. And I think Ambassador has mentioned how he did that, whether it was on nucleus as, uh, you know, uh, abnegation, and uh, whether it was on a pacifist con constitution, and also uh, the defense budget, 2% uh, from 1% that limit, uh, all and building military capability, all of that. I think that was something that he sought to do. And the same thing, as you said, it was very much linked to the foreign policy aspect of it. And uh, in that respect also, what he uh, perhaps uh, really achieved was that he not only uh, uh, had great ideas, but he actually pursued them with resolve to make sure that it actually gets realized. Otherwise, as uh, they say, he would have been a prophet of his times rather than a doer as well. So I think that is something that one has to pay tribute to him. And that's why he's such, he's rated as one of the, or maybe the most important Japanese prime minister in the post Cold War period and 21st century and a statesman, a global statesman in the 21st century. So this is uh, one part of it. I just want to also recall of course, I had the pleasure of meeting him first time in Yokohama at the TICAD 5 conference. And I was completely blown away because I had never seen a Japanese leader like him with so much charisma, out, outgoing and outspoken, and uh, very relatable. And also, it was very clear that he had a different vision of the world than uh, what there had been before. And I was reminded of a wonderful article I saw in the Financial Times, which was titled, The Sun Also Rises. You know, a Hemingway takeaway, but also uh, uh, it was about how this SON, the sun, is going to take Japan to its rise so, because the sun is also, S-U-N, is also uh, Japan's, uh, you know, the land of the rising sun is the national symbol. And the three things that it said is something that I also uh, would take from what you said, Suhasini, an ambassador. The three things that article said, and this was just before he was going to take over. It said that this man, believes in his destiny to take Japan to a different place, to its rightful place in the world. And he talks about uh, the koku eki, that is national interest, and hu kaku, that is dignity and respect, restoring, restoring Japan to the dignity and respect it needs to have in the world. So these are the two things that were very much part of his makeup and that drove him to all the actions and the ideas that he put forward, the visions that he pursued and successfully so. Now, I just want to very quickly come to, uh, if you will give me a, uh, a yes. So uh, now I come to why India, why Japan, and why did Abisan really uh, give it so much priority? Why did India give it so much priority? I think the, the idea about value-based partnership and that, you know, a very a kind of uh, soulmate kind of uh, feeling that he had about India is very much there. But there was also, uh, I think, uh, a circumstantial uh, uh, issue, a very pragmatic 
uh, and national interest, that Kokueki related issue, that he wanted to partner with India in an exceptional way, with an, an intensive way. And that was uh, very much related to the Chinese assertiveness, uh, the, also the neighborhood we shared <laughs> very, uh, you know, uh, major security concerns in our neighborhoods and the South China Sea and all of those other issues. So it was very important, I think, uh, for Abhisama to see in India uh, what they called, uh, I think he called it, great, uh, first of all, broader Asia concept, where he saw India as an integral and a most important part of the Asia strategy of, of Japan. And therefore, I think there was this uh, symbiosis, <laughs> the Kyosei uh, of, of interests, and the moment had come when Abhisama was there, and he seized the moment. He, he was a man of the moment in, in more ways than one. So all of that is very much there. And then uh, I just want to mention two, three other aspects. One is the confluence of the seas. I remember when I was in the 90s, we were do, you know, really very active as India uh, in the look east policy. And we wanted to be in some way associated with the APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. And we wanted to be part of this Asia Pacific community. And we were told, no, you are not on the geographical footprint of the Asia Pacific. And we said, no, but we have Andaman Nicobar, which is, you know, touching and connecting. But it didn't happen. So for India, when Japan, and Prime Minister Abe then put forward the idea of Indo-Pacific. It was a big leap for us uh, in geo-economic, geo-strategic uh, terms. And that is something also why we value the uh, Abhisama and uh, his vision of the free and open uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, the Quad, and I want to also say that the Quad is both a, a bulwark against uh, the aggressions that we may see in, in our Indo-Pacific region, but it is as much a force for good because it is about assuring security, it's about sustainable development, and it is also about prosperity. Uh, and most recently, post-COVID, it has another purpose, that of uh, disaster uh, response and, and cooperation in all of those, uh, you know, whether it's pandemics or natural disasters. So I think there is that aspect that also, and then I want to also say that as part of EBA economics, I think there was a lot that was also done uh, to look at how to se uh, secure supply chain. And Japan also has a very real interest in perhaps not decoupling because we are very heavily invested in China, but at least diversifying and the, the, you know, the deglobalizing uh, and, and French shoring in India. So I think it hasn't gone far enough but it is something that you, Ambassador, have very much the task of taking forward. And uh, two other things you mentioned, women economics, and I had the pleasure of working very closely with him. Here was a Japanese leader who also defied, uh, I think, the very patriarchal, if I may say so, very patriarchal culture, a political culture in, in Japan, and I've witnessed it and to uh, political culture in Japan, and then uh, to, you know, put forward this uh, woman economics and women must shine, uh, you, you know, credo in, in Japan, and then to become a global champion 
he announced uh, in the General Assembly of the UN that he would be, uh, you know, was giving three billion dollars for uh, women empowerment in uh, developing countries, and he became a global champion. And this was again something which was exceptional and and a testimony to his vision and going beyond and transcending uh, established uh, verities. Now, uh, the other thing that I want to, um, you know, recall is his great contribution to what India and Japan share very much, and that is the UN Security Council reform. Before him, and I'm witness to the, uh, this virtually, I mean, and, or, or shall I say <laughs> passively, because, uh, you know, I, I, I've been following this UN Security Council reform for uh, many years, and it is very clear that Abhi Sama was heavily invested in the G4, the group of four countries, Germany, Japan, India, and Brazil, getting to be permanent members of the UN Security Council. You're all aware of this, I hope. So he pushed for the G4 summit in 2015. And that came out with a substantive outcome document showing the way forward for intergovernmental negotiations. And uh, of course, it has been an uphill task, particularly because I think China is not so uh, keen. And, uh, but at some points, I remember, there were even agreements between Japan and China that China will not oppose and things like that. But of course, we have that challenge. But we are very soon, I'm told, going to see some fruit of all that Avisama did and what India has been working to do with Japan in the summit of the future, which is going to take place in September in the UN General Assembly uh, this year. So these are some of the, so overall, what I would say is that uh, Abhisama was someone who, uh, as he thought he would, who took Japan, raised Japan's stature and status in, uh, in the world. And at the same time, I think, did the world much good, and particularly India-Japan relations, he took to a whole new level. And I do hope that his successes, the legacy that he leaves behind in this area, that his successes will continue to take this forward. And, you know, there is a lot of unfinished business in all of the areas. And I particularly am, you know, very much looking forward to the FDI uh, investment, uh, you know, there's much that has happened, but it can't happen more. And also trade, these two uh, aspects going up. There's nuclear cooperation, there's military to military cooperation. All these breakthroughs have happened and it's unimaginable. Uh, it would have been unimaginable without Abhisama. Thank you so much. Uh, Actually, in the book, uh, um, Taniguchi and Kanehara, they actually say that he had a sense of destiny. And, um, and it was not because just he was the grandson of Kishi, but also that his first term ended very quickly. It was just less than a year. And so he had this feeling that he had to come back. He had to come back and it was very unlike most other politicians who if they do a stint as a prime minister, they usually don't want to come back and they want to go back into go into retirement. But for him, retirement was never an option and I'm sure uh, Suzuki son would know more about it. And his uh, comeback was actually uh, very important because he felt that he had some unfinished uh, business to do. Yeah, no. so uh, would you like to say something on that, like about his comeback in, and it's very important when he came back, I think Japan was going through a very problematic 
period because the Fukushima uh, earthquake had just happened. There was this nuclear uh, meltdown which was there, tsunami. Then economy uh, was bad, but the uh, declining population issue was even more. I mean, that is still uh, a big problem. But uh, it, it sort of became very obvious as a social and an economic uh, problem. And, uh, and despite that, which another reason why we say that he was, he challenged the orthodoxy was to overcome the hesitation about nuclear deals. And despite the fact that India is not a signatory to MPT, he, was, he went ahead with a nuclear deal during his yes. time, yes. which is, I think, another a very landmark yes. achievement, which uh, could have actually boomeranged on him politically. But he sort of, even that didn't happen. That showed how he also had a understanding of what people want and he had a very clear perception of what he want, how he wanted to get the things done. So if you would like to say something on that. Oh, thank you. For me, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was a fighter. He had this uh, indomitable spirit to try and try again, even if he couldn't make it the first time. Uh, he always uh, fought for the ideals and visions that he held dear. And uh, the foremost example is the fact that he came back to power again. As you said, when he stepped down after only one year, uh, he was severely criticized and his pride was shattered. But uh, uh, then he had this uh, sense of mission that uh, you know, he felt that he had to pursue uh, these uh, major reforms that uh, he felt was still unfinished. So, so for a politician, it was very risky to run again for the party leadership because if you lose, you're finished forever. But he took the risks and he made it because he felt that he had a number of ideals that he must bring to reality for the Japanese people and for uh, Japan as a country. For example, Quad is uh, one of those uh, visions. Uh, he started his uh, uh, endeavors to establish Quad when he became the first uh, prime minister the first time in 2006. But uh, uh, it was a short-lived premiership and uh, as soon as uh, he stepped down, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd of Australia said, okay, Australia is uh, quitting this uh, uh, undertaking to see if we can create Quad. Now, he never gave up. So just before he officially became the prime minister, he wrote an article uh, as a member of the parliament, which was uh, distributed through uh, Diamond Syndicate. And he argued for creating a security diamond, Japan, India, US, and Australia. And this is essentially quad. So as soon as he started his uh, second administration, he uh, directed me to revive his uh, major drive to establish Quad. So we started at the director general level, and at the same time, whenever we had a chance for a bilateral summit meeting, either with uh, Prime Minister uh, Modi or Prime Minister of the US President, we tried also to have trilats, you know, Japan, India, US, uh, or Japan, India, Australia, uh, which led us to the Quad eventually. But first we had DG level, and then we went on to the foreign minister's level, and finally the Quad. So, so you know the rest of the story. Uh, we had already three Quad summits, and this year India is uh, going to host uh, the Quad summit. Uh, so 
So this is uh, one of the ideals and visions he held dear, that uh, one of the reasons he wanted to come back. So, and uh, he's no longer with us, but his visions still live on. So, so I think that's, uh, that's something that each one of us should become a torchbearer for his vision and uh, carry forward into the future. Thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful that somebody is willing to, so uh, driven by his passion and vision that he was willing to take a political risk of it. As I said, we would like to- uh, May I just add yeah. one other thing, yes. I think which is important to note, why India, Japan, and Abhisama. He had, if I'm not mistaken, he had this panorama view foreign policy element which he had launched. He visited 80 countries, you already mentioned that, uh, in the global south. And that outreach was also about going into the backyards of other countries which in the past Japan had stayed away from and also creating, you know, interests and backyards of your own. And in that, there was already the beginnings of an India-Japan partnership in the global south. Whether it is trilateral, whether it is pan-continental uh, like with Africa. Uh, so there were all of those uh, kind of, you know, I'm not saying it's a, parallel to the BRI of China, but it was something in the direction of Japan retuning its aid and development cooperation policy and also India working with and using its uh, leadership of the Global South to facilitate uh, this partnership with the Global South. So that's another very important area of confluence of the seas. Yeah, actually, that's a very important point. Uh, you know, for Prime Minister Abe, why is India so special? I started with uh, sharing fundamental values, but uh, sharing common strategic interests is another major pillar. Seeing from Prime Minister Abe, he saw India as special partner for two reasons. One is values, the other is strategic interests. And hence, India, for him, was so, so special. When uh, Prime Minister Modi visited Japan in 2018, Prime Minister Abe invited Prime Minister Modi to his uh, personal cottage uh, at the Mount of Fuji, uh, near Lake Kawaguchi. And they had a one-on-one -on -one dinner. So soon afterwards, a number of uh, embassies quietly approached to me saying, can my president, can my prime minister also get invited to Abe-san's cottage? <laughs> prime Minister Abe's answer was always immediate and clear. No, because that place is specifically reserved to Prime Minister Modi. So this is a testament to what kind of special friendship he enjoyed with Prime Minister Modi. Of course, this is personal, but this is underpinned by the special global strategic partnership that uh, Japan and India enjoy. And this is not just for mutual benefits, but this is for the region and the, for the world. Really, Prime Minister Abe was really convinced that Japan and India must take on the leadership role in preserving the peace and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific and the world because we shared strategic common interests and we shared fundamental values. And for him, rule of law was so important. Thank you so much. Uh, so a uh, final question I'd like to ask uh, Suhasini, since you're the one of the persons who have written here, what went into the making of this book? Because uh, you know, it's not every day that uh, we get together to write on a, about a prime minister of another country. 
So I really like to be, uh, know, like, what they, how did Baru approach the book since he's not here? Sure. Uh, you know, I think um, it's an interesting book because none of us ever met. The whole group never actually met. So it's a credit to Dr. Baru, uh, who was able to just pull everyone together, including the external affairs minister, and get them to tap on their strength and their link with this relationship. So there was a very clear focus on what uh, they planned to do. Uh, and each person actually was able to bring out uh, a, a different side to this. So as a, uh, Ambassador Suzuki very kindly said, if you do spend that uh, two weeks reading one chapter every day, you'll come out with a real 360 degree view of it. You know, they, they all spoke about this link with women. And one of our former ambassadors to Japan was a woman, Deepa Gopalan Vadva. And she writes in this book uh, about a time where I think she was speaking at a very small function uh, and she was talking about, uh, uh, you know, programs for Indian women uh, and uh, various things, you know, the, the cooperative societies, loans, uh, as well as the LPG, you know, cylinder uh, schemes in India and that sort of thing. When she got a message to say the prime minister wants to come and she said, but why on earth would the prime minister want to come uh, to this? But he did, he did show up and he did speak about the importance of including women in this. So, you know, a lot of what we say, obviously, there's this feeling always that when somebody passes on, you only say nice things about them. Uh, and you've heard a lot of very nice things today. Uh, there's, you know, there's nobody who is without controversy, who doesn't polarize on some issue or the other. But I think when it came to this India-Japan connect, there was something very pure. And I think that's what is driving this book. I think as a uh, Japanologist, what I find it amazing that uh, people in India from diverse uh, spheres like scholars, journalists, academicians would actually get together think, uh, and write, uh, ch write their chapters on Shinzo Abe about a prime minister of another country and then uh, that actually shows how important he is for India. And the fact that we are having this discussion um, on this book, it also shows how relevant He's even today in our contemporary times and he's going to, a legacy is going to go on for a for much longer time. So with that note, I would actually like to thank our audience who were all here today morning and especially to Ambassador Suzuki. I think he had, he was to be going out of the town and I don't know what he did with that appointment, but he's here with us. And also Ambassador Puri who was, who's been kind enough to uh, come here and join us here. And uh, of course, Suhasini were wonderful and very emotional. I know what the emotional connect with this book is also very evident. So thank you so much uh, to all our speakers.